Rumberg, um, to just make about five minutes of comments about um, U.S.-Iran policy and uh, maybe take one or two questions. Okay, well, um, I, I will keep my, my uh, remarks brief in order to provide really an opportunity for, for discussion. I think it's going to be more interesting. Um, I just want to uh, 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 reemphasize a point that uh, I made earlier. It was really difficult to capture many aspects of the contribution, my contribution to this uh, particular um, uh, paper, but, and that is the, this kind of map I gave you of factional politics and the way in which the process uh, works of inclusion as opposed to exclusion, the balancing act between the supreme leader and the various factions. All of this is literally and figuratively fueled by oil. And uh, the rents derived from the sale of oil are used both within the, pro the public sector, the uh, within the parasitals, statals, and within the, the private sector, essentially to keep all these players playing the game. And that is why, of course, it's very unlikely. The, the paper is interesting because the paper demonstrates quite rationally the benefits that would accrue from a rationalization of the oil industry in Iran. But the Iran, Iran's uh, economic policies when it comes to oil are largely driven by political and geostrategic calculations. And that's why, despite all the arguments we can come up with for the benefits that would come with removing, for example, the subsidies on gas, uh, on gas and, and oil, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because the political consequences are too great, uh, and the, re the regime is not going to uh, endanger its own stability. That is in part why the, you see in, in Iran an argument for moving towards nuclear energy. This argument is that the nuclear energy will relieve some of the uh, stress and some of the um, uh, burden that the oil industry has to maintain for, the, for maintaining political stability. And I'm sure that if you would talk to leaders of the National Oil Company, they would say, well, go ahead and uh, pursue nuclear energy. This is going to take some of the, the weight off of us. But I think the, the report suggests that it's very minimal, um, uh, the, that the, the actual gains uh, will be quite limited unless, the, uh, unless Iran exp expands dramatically from its current project for nuclear energy. So um, it's, it's a domestic political question um, very much in terms of maintaining the stability. Um, but having said that, um, because there is a desire from the, uh, from the conservative camp to, uh, to uh, uh, recoup some of the losses that they, that they felt politically and economically as a consequence of this, the, uh, the Ahmadinejad surge, if I use, may, may use that uh, term, I think that we'll, we, will, we see that in the long term uh, there is an opportunity here to build uh, some sort of relationship with forces uh, that uh, are loyal to the regime, but who want to reintegrate Iran into the, uh, into the international economic order and have certain concrete interests in doing so. That would require from the United States uh, coming to terms with the kinds of issues. There is this irrational aspect to our relationship with uh, Iran. Uh, it, it, there are echoes of Cuba here. Uh, and there is, there is a lot of hurt. There is a lot of hum, uh, humiliation. Um, and, of course, it exists on both sides. When I was in Iran the first time and interviewed on television, the interviewer asked me what I thought, of, what the American people thought of Khomeini. And I froze. I thought, what a bizarre question. And I couldn't tell him that most Americans get up and they don't think of Khomeini. He couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't conceive that he would get up in the morning and not think. So if he thinks about, about Khomeini every morning, why don't we? And this was a wonderful projection of his own obsessions onto Americans. But, that, but having said that, it's true that there is a kind of legacy of this humiliation in this anger over the, the hostage crisis and so on. There is this. I think it, goes, it, it's much, it runs much deeper than um, the mere question of it's not mere, but the important question of Iranian support for terrorism and so on. And I think we all agree that uh, one of the one of the paradoxical consequences of American intervention in Iraq is to greatly expand Iran's uh, political and military leverage in the regime in, in the region in ways that really limit. Uh, the kinds of alternatives that we can pursue in dealing with Iran. Um, and the Bush administration, uh, I, up, up, up to a month ago, I, my position was that the uh, probability of an attack by the United States on Iranian nuclear facilities was extremely remote. Uh, 
I still think it's remote, but I've removed the word extremely from it. Um, because uh, the experts tell us that they, we don't know exactly what the targets are, where to hit, and how, and how to hurt them. Uh, the window of opportunity to do so is closing for the Bush administration. But it's not inconceivable that Bush will decide that as a kind of parting gift, if I may use that term, uh, uh, the, the United States will strike and try to impose some sort, of, uh, 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 some sort of cost on Iran. My sense is that it's very difficult to predict, and I would warn against this, what the domestic implications of such an attack are. The usual sort of position you hear is, well, it's going to unify the groups and the forces, and everybody, well, that will happen. There will be m marches on Friday, death to America. There will be retaliation in Lebanon and in Iraq and perhaps Argentina. There, one knows that. So there are consequences, but my sense is that uh, when the smoke's clear, when smoke clears, uh, Ahmadinejad would, look, would, would be weakened, not strengthened, by, by, because the conservatives say, look, here's the, here's the further example of the cost, cost we are paying for these sorts of uh, policies. Um, but the real question for me is whether there's going to be the kinds of political changes in, in Washington ter, in ter, and in Tehran uh, and the political will to do to, to the only thing that's, that's, that's possible, and that is resolve these issues through negotiations. I really do not believe that there's any alternative. Uh, well, we can persist in our conflict or we can talk, but I, I don't think there, there, are two, uh, there are two real clear alternatives to that. So I'll leave that for now and just to welcome any questions you may have. I'd be happy to range far and wide on the regional issues, Lebanon, Hezbollah, whatever, but I, but I just wanted to leave it that. I think it's more interesting to have a conversation than to, to lecture. Anybody have uh, some qu any, qu any remaining questions on thinking about U.S. policy on Iran? Is there any? Oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, excuse me. Well, uh, just a real quick one. Uh, has Iran really paid any price for its involvement in Lebanon and, and, and all this bad stuff that we think it's doing? Is, or, or is it really paying any price that is significant to it, or are they getting, getting um, risk free? It hasn't paid much of a price. I think that I was alluding to that before in my previous presentation. Um, the relationship between Hezbollah and, and Iran is, is started out as a patronage relationship and it's become a, a partnership, a complex partnership. Um, the Iranians must worry that the, uh, that the situation in Lebanon has gone beyond a certain point that can no longer be contained. And the question will be whether they can use their leverage to, uh, to, to prevent an all-out civil war, for example. It won't be easy to do that. Uh, but they haven't paid much of a price. The Iranian approach is basically to use all the assets they have, to deploy them as, 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 as skillfully and as, as, as ambiguously as they can, to cre create all kinds of options uh, so they can hit back when they have to, so they can resort to <coughs> negotiations uh, when they have to, and just basically to survive another day. Uh, do you foresee any kind of a uh, negotiated solution with Iran that does not result in, a, in an Iranian nuclear device? That's a, that's a good and tough question. I don't think that the Iranians will ever declare, declare that they have such a device, nor, do they do, nor would they get the most strategic benefit from doing so, quite the, quite the opposite. So I think what they will do is they will, they will uh, pursue nuclear energy and on the side create, create the components uh, that, would, that could be assembled at some other date uh, fairly quickly to move towards nuclear weapons if they felt they had to. Um, the question is not whether that happens. The question is, the United States lives with a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of countries that have nuclear weapons. Some of them we like, some of them we don't. The question is, what is, what is the context of Iran's relationship in the region and, in, and, in, and with the United States and, and, and the Europeans in the broader context? Is it friendly or is it hostile? Um, it's the hostility of the Iranian regime, the perceived hostility. We had an interesting conversation over lunch about this issue. The Ahmadinejad's uh, rhetoric only sort of understandably intensifies the perception that this country is hostile and, in fact, talks about uh, whether you whether we've interpreted his words correctly or not, talks about wiping out or getting rid of or diminishing or the withering away of the Zionist entity. Whatever. I mean, these sorts of you know, these are these are the kinds of issues that I think can, can only be uh, resolved not through I must say not through a kind of military confrontation, but essentially by trying to draw out those Iranian forces who want a different kind of relationship with the United States. Unfortunately, our ha we are really limited in the kinds of. Uh, 
uh, options we have in terms of coercion to change Iranian behavior. Uh, and co paradoxically, the limitations that we are now facing are a consequence of our own policies. We've been waiting around, fiddling with Iraq, creating opportunities for the Iranians, and, and suddenly we find ourselves uh, with, uh, uh, with, with far fewer options than we, than we would have wished. Um, but my sense is that there's also this great psychological kind of um, aspect to this relationship that has an irrational or non-rational aspect to it. Um, I would, my own sense is, and I would participate in second track diplomacy meetings with the Iranians for, for, for two years on and off overseas, and the Iranians would always say, well, we need respect. Uh, the Rodney Dangerfield kind of position, uh, you, and you'd say, "How well, the Americans say, how do you operationalize respect? What do we, you know, what do we need to do to to address this sort of deep, deep sense of grievance? It's not an easy thing to sort of to talk about in, in the context of negotiations. Um, some sort of dramatic move to break the ice. Um, some uh, is, is, some people have argued. My colleague." Uh, Ambassador Bill Lures, who, who has proposed on the, the New York Review of Book, I think a very interesting and, and pragmatic solution to the current standoff with the Iranians on nuclear power, nuclear weapons. Uh, he, he has also suggested, and I, I ad advise everyone here to read it because it's really, I think, a, 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 p a potential exit from this, this conflict, uh, this particular conflict. But Lures has uh, suggested a kind of Shanghai declaration and that echoes the Shanghai Declaration between the United States and Kissinger and the Chinese in 1972, I think it was, where we basically list our grievances, our differences, and our potential areas for, for a negotiation without resolving them and agree to meet and talk. Now, a case, in the case of uh, uh, that, in that process, the big bear was the Russian bear, or the Soviet bear. That's what got those two players together. We don't have a comparable player to get the United States and the Russian, uh, the United States and the Iranians together. But we would have to have some sort of breakthrough where we finally decide we were going to talk in earnest and really, uh, really put this relationship out there for for a serious negotiation. Um, and I think that requires um, uh, political will, and I think it requires, to some extent, uh, from the United States, a willingness to sort of concede the kind of existence of, of the Islamic Republic that we've really sort of found, it, found hard to sort of come to terms with. But having said that, there's no symmetry here. I think it's very hard for the Iranians to come to terms with the United States because in contrast to the United States, the Islamic Republic's legitimacy is in, bar, is in part built on hostility to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, there's no, there's no symmetry there. Um, there, there's, there's the the anti-Americanism is built into the foundation of the regime itself. It's very hard for the hardliners to give that up. Um, and, and it's very hard for them to see any set of incentives that would make them give up, uh, because for them, the, the anti-Americanism is woven into the very legitimacy of the Islamic Republic. So how does an rep Islamic Republic like that? Well, it, it happens only through a long process by which the leadership of Iran, uh, of the Islamic Republic, starting from the very top, the supreme leader himself decides that they're going to redefine the ideological foundation of that state. And the only person who really has the capacity or power to do that is the supreme leader. Uh, that is why the struggle over the council of experts, which decides, which chooses the supreme leader, is so significant, and why the battle between Rafsanjani and, uh, and, and the supporters of Ahmadinejad for control of that council was, was, no, was no small event, because eventually the time will come, a year or two from now, in which Rafsanjani will do what he did in 1989 and 90, and that is help choose the next supreme leader. And, and that will, that will, so we're talking about a process of change that takes years. That takes years. In Washington, we want things to occur in weeks and months and days. We have no patience. We, we don't see beyond a one-year budget cycle uh, or a four-year presidential cycle. But the fact of the matter is that we have to think in 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, how are we going to manage this? Can we, avoid, what, can we avoid a war? Can we avoid a nuclear Iran? And what can we do to sort of create a context in which the, the slowly but surely the forces that are going to redefine what it means to have an Islamic Republic. The Islamic Republic will be there. And one, and one positive development in all this is the notion of prom promoting regime change in Tehran, which was in part a foundation of the Bush doctrine and one that has, I think, been justifiably discredited, this notion that we can somehow resolve the, the security dilemma or security problem with Iran by expecting that the regime will fall. We had to deal with that sort of that sort of uh, uh, um, 
utopian expectation. Remember the first, it's extraordinary, the first days and weeks when we went into Baghdad, oh, there's all this talk about going to go to Karbala and the, the new Najaf and it's going to be the center of a new clerical uh, cast of liberal clerics and we're going to create a new, and everybody's going to come from Tehran, Gulman come to uh, Najaf and we're going to create a, it was this wild sort of expectation that this, that, that this regime was going to be sort of, uh, 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 its days were numbered, if not weeks or months or perhaps years. But it's a solid institutionalized beast. <laughs> not, it, perhaps that's not, not the, the nicest metaphor to use, but it's a very wily, very effective political, uh, 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 political regime, well institutionalized, the capacity to co-opt and bring new members into the fold has been demonstrated, as I talked about this morning. And we have to sort of learn to sort of live with this regime and influence it in ways that uh, are beneficial to our own own interests. Um, and we've sort of learned the hard way that uh, the notion that we can go in and sort of uh, remove a regime and, and, and derive uh, clear benefits is, 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 is illusory. So uh, I think we, we were sort of, there's been sort of, there's been learning on both sides of the equation, but it's going to take years. This is not something that's going to resolve itself uh, quickly. And, and one, it, let's keep in mind that when the United States and China met in 1972, it took seven more years to reach an agreement, right? It took seven years of negotiations. Um, so it's, uh, it's not something that's going to be resolved overnight. I, I guess uh, the, taxi, the taxi's here. Thank you very much. portion uh, of our uh, program, or I should say the last portion, um, is really to look at um, U.S. policy uh, mainly through the lens of uh, climate issues. And uh, are you guys dividing the talk? Uh, or is somebody talking Matt, first? Matt will be carrying the burden and I will be standing by. Okay, so uh, Matt Chen, who is our uh, Research associate will be delivering our talk on this area, and then Joe Barnes, who is his co-author, is here also to participate in the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll try to be quick and as concise as possible. Um, undoubtedly, this is one of the most exciting elections we've had in many recent years, and climate change is really at one of the forefronts of the agenda being discussed. Um, let's see. But we want to be sure to say that our paper and our presentation really aren't going to be about the scientific basis behind climate change. We really do um, accept and build our case upon the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change findings. Um, generally speaking, there is a consensus that a two to three degree Celsius increase would represent a potential dangerous threshold. Um, in 2005, the uh, parts per million of CO2 equivalent were roughly 380. And an increase looking at 450 to 550 parts per million, again, could represent another dangerous threshold that has been discussed by the IPCC. Um, we're going to continue by looking at where policy stands in the United States today. Um, there have been all kinds of movements across federal, state, and local levels. Uh, this is a really interesting image because if you can see it clearly, it gives you a sense for where a lot of our emissions are actually coming from. And it's not probably that surprising. Um, but what might be equally interesting is to look at where the response to climate change is actually occurring. Um, there have been a lot of initiatives on various state levels to implement what might be called renewable energy portfolio standards. Um, the Mayor's Climate Protection Initiative has also, I think, garnered about 800 different cities around the United States to sign on uh, to different climate initiatives. We're also seeing states in blue here which have agreed to the climate registry to start to tally what kind of emissions levels they're actually having. Um, and then, of course, Governor Schwarzenegger, as I think we all know, is one of the leaders of uh, climate policy in California and even in the United States. There are actually three initiatives now across the country, um, multi-state initiatives, to tackle the issue. Uh, the Midwestern governors got together at the end of last year. That's the most recent initiative. The two, though, that are really furthest along, there's the Western Climate Initiative here, which does include some Canadian provinces, by the way, and also the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the Northeast. And so taking a quick closer look at what might be called the REGI here, it's actually a multi-state cap-and-trade market-based emissions system. They would first like to stabilize their emissions by uh, 2015, and then in the next five-year period actually reduce them by about 10%. The other really notable point is that they want to sell their um, allowances rather than give them away for free. Um, and then California itself has 
the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006. They want to implement a cap and reduce emissions levels here um, quite substantially. The California Regulatory Agency is moving ahead to look at the different ways in which this can be carried forward. Uh, the cap would take effect in 2012. It would become more stringent. One other point, though, that is relevant is that they have actually talked about how perhaps 60 percent of their reductions might happen because of regulatory mechanisms, not just cap and trade. So California has a very holistic approach. Um, again, this just illustrates that transportation is a very, very large part of the California emissions situation. It's also worth looking at their in-state versus imported electricity as well. Um, again, we've also noticed a developing dynamic between the states and the federal government. Um, where there is actually some disagreement, especially with the current administration. Uh, we have seen the rise in fuel economy standards recently passed. California, however, has tried to actually move ahead and regulate emissions from cars, which is a bit different from increasing fuel economy standards. So the EPA has actually refused to grant California a waiver under the Clean Air Act because the EPA says, look, we need a national policy. We can't let California go out in front. But California is basically saying, hey, but you know, we are at the leadership of the country here. We'd like to be progressive. So there's a real clash going on right now. Um, and so uh, it really will be resolved by the courts or potentially the next administration. Um, so then turning to the Congress, there are all kinds of bills being promulgated right now. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Um, the leading bill right now is probably the Lieberman Warner Climate Security Act, but of course Senator McCain has been a major proponent of action as well. Um, looking at the Climate Security Act, I just had heard today that Senator Boxer has come out with an amendment which would um, essentially put in a safety valve essentially to moderate the price volatility issue. Um, the act as it stands out of committee would allow about 30 percent of commitments to be met by offsets or international trading. The plan, though, under this act is not really as ambitious as what the Democratic candidates, at least, are proposing. Um, under 2005 levels by 2050, they're looking at about 66 percent, um, and that's a good deal less than the 80 percent that both Senators Clinton and Obama have discussed. Um, also, this is going to target about 87 percent of U.S. greenhouse gas sources. So it's quite comprehensive, but not all-inclusive. Um, the other key point is that the auction credits are going to rise over time, but they're never going to hit 100 uh, percent. Some of the allowances will actually be given for free to states and what might be called non-regulated entities, so they can use them in a way to encourage voluntary action. Um, uh, the final point here is that we have seen economic analyses by government agencies, and there could be some substantial price increases in gasoline and electricity if this goes forward. Um, looking at how the Senate has actually treated the issue in the past, uh, Senator McCain's bill in 2003 failed, but it did get 43 votes. In the Senate, you have to remember, there's about a 60-vote threshold. Otherwise, any U.S. senator can filibuster a bill, and it won't really go anywhere. In 2005, uh, an attempt again to reintroduce the bill failed. McCain added some more subsidies for nuclear power that most people or more people opposed. Um, then the Lieberman-Warner bill passed Senate committee about 11 to 8 in last year. Uh, more recently, there have been a little bit of maneuverings by different senators to um, restrict the freedom of action by the Senate on the issue, but those have been successful. The last key point here is that an amendment by Barbara Boxer to get the Senate on the record in favor of cap and trade as a concept as part of the FY09 budget bill actually passed with 55 votes in favor. So that may be the most number of votes we've seen uh, in support of cap and trade. Um, then turning to international policy, I think we mostly know the U.S. history here, but it's worth noting that it's very likely that the next president will support greenhouse gas regulation. Uh, the Bali meeting that met uh, at the end of last year did go forward with some proposals, but there's a lot of deadlock still between countries like China and India and the U.S. about what is able to uh, go forward. Um, just yesterday, it was suggested by a U.S. State Department official that China joined the International Energy Agency, which is one of the key coordinating bodies for consuming countries. Um, this is a potentially major step to encourage uh, consuming country cooperation. Um, again, this is also important because the Kyoto Protocol is due to expire in 2012. Um, one last little note here is that uh, China and Japan recently had a very high-level meeting in which there was a statement released where the Chinese government has expressed some support for the Japanese government's um, approach, which is primarily sectoral, looking at different industries.
But we all have to keep in mind that the uh, world energy demand is forecasted to grow very substantially and that the leadership of the IEA really does think that fossil fuels will remain at the forefront of our immediate future. Um, but again, as some of my colleagues had earlier discussed, very importantly, if we're going to see fossil fuel use increase and if greenhouse gas regulation goes forward, what does that mean for climate security on the one hand and energy security on the other? Um, if as a recent Energy Department report suggested, we could get 20% of U.S. electricity from wind energy by 2030. What else does that leave out? What about intermittency of wind? What about additional shadow capacity? What about transmission and storage? These are unresolved issues that I don't mean to suggest are impossible to tackle, but they must be tackled to achieve this level of viability. Uh, the last point here is Governor Schwarzenegger has actually found that some environmentalists in California who like the idea of renewable energy are going to say, well, look, if you want to put solar plants in the Mojave Desert, uh, what about the transmission lines? And some people are saying, well, we don't want the transmission lines coming through our neighborhoods and other things. And Governor Schwarzenegger says, well, if you want clean energy, we have to resolve that. And then a couple slides here, just looking at emissions from a graphic point of view. It's quite clear that per capita, the U.S. and uh, some other countries are still well ahead of China and other uh, newly industrializing nations. However, if you look at the lower level here, it's also clear that developing countries will, before too long, exceed U.S. level emissions. Um, again, looking at the annual picture, you can see how important China is to the mix. But again, looking historically, the United States and Europe are still responsible for the vast majority. Um, one note with this slide here is to note how Russian emissions have actually fallen off. So any international carbon trading system would, in theory, favor the Russians, and that's something that you've seen the president uh, speak out somewhat against. Um, the U.S. emissions obviously continue to increase apace. Um, this map just talks about some uh, different international initiatives. The slides will be online, so feel free to check later. Um, again, this slide here will show you how important coal is to the U.S. emission mix as well as petroleum for transportation. Um, Dr. Medlock uh, kindly shared some graphs he did over here which talk about rural uh, petroleum use. And it's clear, again, how the U.S. is using so much petroleum for uh, transportation and also how much emissions the U.S. is producing from that. Um, also, we have to really consider the adaptation issues here. Um, it's quite clear that some of the people who could be on the front lines of climate change impacts are also among those who are least responsible, and I think this map makes that uh, crystal clear. Um, and the Secretary General of the UN has even said that climate could be a catalyst factor in some of the conflicts we've seen in Sudan. And finally, the World Health Organization has also done some assessments of what climate change could do for human health around the world, and that is also worth looking into. And then getting back to perhaps the most important point for all of us here is the presidential election. What is going to hold for our future on this issue? Um, there's been a lot going on domestically, um, but it's really clear that this is going to be one of the most difficult issues to achieve political consensus on, not only here at home, but internationally. But I would argue that before the U.S. can be a leader internationally, we actually have to have a, a certain level of domestic consensus to move forward. About half the states actually have these RPS standards. We have seen efforts by business to create the United States Carbon Action Partnership, which um, brings together some key stakeholders, such as, and I believe, environmental defense and some of the leading oil companies, to uh, push for cap and trade at the congressional level. It's really extraordinary. Um, there's also ICAP, which brings together a couple of sovereign nation states, the European Union, trying to see if Washington isn't acting, what can be done to share best practices around the world until the US steps up. Again, uh, you may have seen this slide before in one of Ms. Jaffe's presentations. Um, I want to point out the difference here between the Democratic and Republican opinions about how central global warming is as a problem. Um, the other point here is if you look at the graph on the right, there is still a very strong majority opposed to uh, taxes on gasoline to deal with carbon emissions. Um, the two Democratic candidates have very similar energy and climate proposals. Um, Senator McCain is quite clearly a leading voice among the Republican Party on this issue. So there, there is also considerable distance between all the candidates today and previous presidential campaigns. Um, but as you will we'll see as we go ahead, the Democrats would like to create an international global energy forum to bring together some of the leading industrialized countries, India, China, some other major emitters together. They want to try to develop technology transfer and invest as much as $150 billion in new clean energy programs. 
uh, and they are going to be a lot less friendly to the industry potentially as well. Um, they support a lot of efficiency measures and um, some really interesting programs to support green jobs in the United States too. Um, Finally, also, if you look at clean coal, they have some subtle differences, but they both recognize that that can be very important for the U.S. moving forward. Uh, notice that nuclear, though, doesn't appear on the list as a very key item for them. Uh, going to Senator McCain, he really pushes cap and trade, but his focus is not so much regulatory as support for R&D. Um, he would support U.S. leadership uh, internationally, and he would support cap and trade but he wouldn't really support a 100% auction system. And that's something that the Democrats have argued very, very strongly in for. Um, there's a lot of questions about what happens to revenue that is generated from auction. Some people suggest we should do a rebate. It could be a way to lower taxes otherwise. Um, but Senator McCain supports what we're seeing in Lieberman Warner right now, which is a mixed proportion of auction and free allocation. Um, he would definitely support R&D again for federal technology support efforts. Um, there's a last point here that does need to be emphasized. He gave a very important speech on climate change on May 12th of this year. And in his remarks prepared for delivery, he mentioned what would be called a cost equalization mechanism, which some people might just say is a tariff. Well, when he actually gave that speech, those words were not included. So he is aware of the potential impacts that that could have. Um, but uh, we have to keep in mind that among the Democrats, this is still very much on the table. Senator Edwards certainly had it as part of his personal platform. So this issue itself may well come back. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any interest in pursuing this further, there are a couple of suggested readings right there. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're almost to the close of the conference. I invite uh, comments or questions uh, from the audience. I'm tired you guys out. Okay, well, we really uh, appreciate uh, uh, your uh, participation today. Uh, very wide range of uh, topics uh, covered. Uh, for those of you who are readers and don't like to read on the internet uh, and haven't gone to the paper collection over here to the right, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, pick up some copies of some of the pre uh, papers that are behind the presentations you've heard today. Uh, just to give you a, an idea of our schedule of events, uh, we will have uh, in June uh, our usual program on the BP statistical review, looking at uh, BP's view of how uh, the trends have changed over the past year should be interesting. Um, we are um, we are planning a major conference on energy in Latin America uh, for uh, the, the second half of the year and um, have a new report coming out on U.S. biofuels policy uh, in the fall, which we hope will uh, inform the new president and hopefully reevaluate our biofuels policies in a way that are a little less impactful on food and environment and a little more impactful on uh, energy security. So I thank you all. We look forward to uh, being in touch, and we will uh, send you emails as new events come forth and as we have new studies coming out, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you.